So the first question comes from Caroline in Halifax. And Caroline says, should I feel guilty about weeding? I was digging up and composting some teasels in my garden the other day and my elderly neighbour popped his head over the fence and gave me a right talking to for depriving his beloved finches. I now feel really terrible for the finches and I cannot sleep at night. Poor thing. So you should, it's a disgrace. There is hundreds and hundreds of starving finches all over Halifax and do you know whose fault it is? It is yours. Okay. Um, no, uh, don't feel guilty about weeding. Uh, what I think, uh, very few people are successful enough at weeding to remove every weed from their garden. There's always something left over and you should try and leave a little bit of something for everybody. Um, there is no law that you have to have a weed-free garden. Nobody's going to come along and knock on the door and say, excuse me, We've heard that you've got weeds in your garden and drag you off and clap you in irons and, 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 and bang you in prison. That's not going to happen. Um, so, 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 so you weed, weeding, I rather like weeding. I quite, do you like weeding? Yeah, I quite like weeding. I don't mind sort of, sort of just burying yourself and disappearing into, into weeding. Some people think, oh God, I've got to do the weeding. In which case they, they're in the wrong place and they should really just move into a flat somewhere which hasn't got any garden at all. Um, if you have a garden, you have to do weeding. One of, one of the few advantages of lockdown is, is that I've managed to beat the bindweed in this garden for this year. It'll be back next year, it'll be just bad and you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but you sort of just, just go, go with it. So, so yes. There are some, I mean, I don't, I personally don't count teasel as a weed, actually. I count teasel as actually quite a pretty plant that has a good uh, architectural structure in the winter. And yes, obviously is like by, by, by finches and all, all of that kind of stuff. So I think you should leave the teasels because they're, they're, they're interesting and they're nice. There are other weeds that I would not leave. If the neighbor had stuck his head over the wall and said, how dare you dig out the ground elder? Then, then, uh, then I think that she'd be just, ju justifiably miffed that this person was telling them that. I mean, ground elder, ground elder, do you know how ground elder got into this country? It was brought over by the Romans as a foodstuff, basically. Um, uh, and um, because a, a Roman legionary basically lived off porridge. Uh, and, and that's all they ate, pretty much, except when they could find something else. And so, so they brought over the ground elder and they planted it on the sides of the Roman road. So as they were walking along and they stopped and said, right, go 10 minutes for lunch, boys. And they would get out their porridge and say, mmm, porridge, yum, yum, my favorite. What am I going to have with my porridge today? And there would be a little bunch of ground elder and they would then get some ground elder to put in their porridge, which means they would get some chlorophyll and a bit of vitamin, whatever you get from, from ground elder. Um, so so, so, so uh, it was useful in those days. Unfortunately, the Romans buggered off back to Rome and didn't take the ground elder with them. So now it's absolutely everywhere and you just have one of those things you have to actually live with. So, so there are some weeds that you have to learn to live with because you're never going to defeat them at all. Um, a teasel is a teasel. I, I'm taking teasel off the list of weeds. It ain't a weed. Yes, it will seed itself. What a teasel does, which is quite cool, um, is it actually the seeds within that sort of, um, what should we call it, that sort of dome on the top of it, they will germinate while they're still in the dome. So by the time you get to late autumn, they're green. There's little green dots all the way. So, so before the seeds actually fall off, they actually begin to, to, to germinate. So, so yeah, hands off the teasels, put your effort into butterclups, bindweed, cooch grass, ground elder, all the other, you know, um, uh, bitter cress. Uh, I can't think of any other weeds off the top of my head, but there's lots of other things that you should put your effort in. So, so, so do not feel guilty about weeding. Do not give up weeding, but just leave some for the finches and for your next door neighbor. The next question comes from Steve in Norfolk and he says, I'm planting a mini orchard in my back garden. What's the oldest variety of pear tree successfully grown in this country and how old is it? Here in the gardens we have a, a Worcester black pear which was certainly documented in the early 17th century. Um, it possibly came in with the Romans into the UK um, it's not an eating pear as such, you wouldn't take it off the tree and eat it. You have to cook with it, but it is one of the best cookers and it is still available. The next question comes from Joy in Gloucestershire and she says, I love alpines and I'm building a south facing alpine garden at the front of my house and I'm looking for inspiration. 
where is the best place in the UK to see alpines growing naturally in the wild? A mountain. <laughs> where else do you think you're going to find it? Obviously, I mean, that's, that, that's the thing to do. Um, most alpines as grown in alpine gardens are not native to this country. Uh, and then they come from places that have Alps. The clue is in the name. Um, so they're sort of, you know, France, Switzerland, all of that sort of the Dolomites and all of those sort of other bits and pieces. So, so I don't know. Okay, first thing, first thing, you can see them growing naturally in the wild, but you should never ever uh, harvest or pick or dig up things that are growing in the wild uh, and, the, and, and, and bring, them, bring them back home because that is, that is vandalism and unacceptable. Um, uh, in that the, the plants, alpines or woodland plants, you should, you're walking through uh, a wood and you're tempted by a snowdrop, don't dig it up from there. That's a bad, a bad and naughty thing to do. And I'm sure that Joy would never even dream of doing anything like that. Um, but in order to go and look for alpines growing wild, you basically have to put your boots on and climb a mountain. Uh, because the essence of it is that, that, you know, an alpine plant, some of them will be growing lower down, most, but they're basically growing on that sort of scree, which is basically just lots of loose, loose stone, like growing, growing in gravel and things like that. So you're looking for somewhere where it doesn't have much soil, doesn't have much richness. Uh, there will be low plants because they, they, if they stay low, then they duck underneath the wind and they're not being blown off, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But actually the best places to go to look at alpine plants are other alpine gardens. Uh, all of the RHS gardens have, have good alpine gardens. There's a really uh, excellent, Alpine house at Harlow Carr. Uh, she's in Gloucestershire. That's probably not convenient for her to go to, to, go to Harlow Carr. But there will be there's there's a there's a little one at Rosemore in Devon. Uh, there's a little Alpine house, but it's a much it's a much smaller arrangement. There's a very good one at Wisley, uh, and there will be one at Hyde Hall, but I can't remember where it is. Uh, but there's th th there is one there. So 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 Alpine garden Alpine gardening is one of those interesting things. In that I looked at alpines. Uh, when I was younger, I thought, ugh, ugh, why would I be interested in growing anything? <laughs> Little meansy meansy things. I want things that are large and exciting and dramatic and all that sort of stuff. I don't want them. And then, and then, and then, now I rather fancy an alpine. I rather like an alpine. I like succulents, which I think is a step towards alpine gardening. Um, very much indeed. I, I, yeah, I have great sort of pots and pots and pots of them out there, far too many of them, um, uh, because they're fun and they're exciting and, and the same thing. And, and the idea of, of a, um, a crevice garden, a crevice garden, crevice garden is basically when all the stones are, are like that. So there's, there's lots, of little, lots of little gaps. So it's, it's, it's as if it had been a partly eroded part of, um, of a mountainside and then gravel is in here and then you plant the plants into there. So they're sort of spinning off. I saw a really lovely one of those, where was that? Uh, not convenient, no, not convenient for Gloucestershire, it was in Canada. Um, so, so not exactly a sort of weekend trip. Um, uh, but, but, but it is, if you're looking for inspiration for an alpine garden, go to another alpine garden rather than schlepping off up a, up, up a mountain. Nice to go and schlep, up, up, schlep off up the mountain anyway. Um, uh, go sensibly, wear sensible shoes, um, take a jacket and, and uh, a Mars bar uh, and whatever else you sort of, sort of need in order to do it uh, and go and look at plants there, but do not dig them up. Just look, do not touch. Um, uh, and if you want to touch them, there's lots of nurseries which do things and there's, um, uh, as I say, go to RHS Gardens or all of the Botanic Gardens. Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh have got one. I think Botanic Gardens in Birmingham have got one. Uh, uh, yeah, all sorts of, all sorts of, sorts of jolly places. So go climb a mountain and leave your shovel at home, Joy. <laughs> the next question comes from Judith in York. And Judith says, as lockdown has lifted, I have found new solace in visiting my local walled garden. Please can you tell me what the fireplaces are for within the garden walls? Are they fireplaces? Not technically, um, but I think if you look to, to most kitchen gardens, that's what, that the heyday for them was sort of um, throughout Victorian times. Um, and a lot of the developments in, in horticulture were, were within the kitchen gardens and those, those intense sort of growing spaces. Um, and as if the, the, the walled gardens weren't enough in themselves to add a bit of extra heat, if, if it was to a, a wall itself or to a grow frame, would, would just... You could you can get the season going a bit a bit quicker and grow some more exotic fruits and things, um, 
so what what have been taken for fireplaces are, are heating systems of sorts so i guess it's um depending on the, the application it's there's likely to be a flue system there somewhere um typical one is um a hollow wall um you get good sort of on a, on a south wall for instance you get good good sun the brick retains the, the heat from the sun all day but if you can add heat to that you can lengthen out the system um bring bring things on quicker etc and just offer extra perfect protection that some plants would would like so um yeah not not fireplaces for warming your hands as such but yeah it's all about plants and uh, creating that better growing um, opportunities the next question comes from helen in bristol and helen says i recently went to a barbecue at my friend's house socially distanced of course and she had the most beautiful salad full of, full of edible flowers or so she said I'd never thought about growing flowers for eating. What are the best heritage edible flowers to grow? Nasturtium as pansies look really pretty on a plate and really vibrant. Things like lavender can introduce scent and slight sweetness. And things like a snapdragon flower can look pretty cool on the edge of a cocktail glass, although the flower is slightly bitter. Okay, I had absolutely no idea you could eat snapdragons. That is really cool and I bet it makes an amazing showstopper on a cocktail glass with a few sparklers, a few umbrellas, showing my class now. The next question comes from Peter and he says, I live in Scarborough and I'd like to grow a meadow but don't know what seed mix to get. I'd like something that would be a natural heritage mix to this area to support the local wildlife. Do you have any recommendations? so oh it's so difficult i mean i would love to have a meadow but then what i say is a meadow might not be what you think is a meadow so i think that's the first thing is that we have to really think very carefully you know what are you looking for now one of the things that they did at the yorkshire arboretum um john grimshaw and his team there they just stopped mowing the grass they had so they started to mow pathways through the trees and then all of a sudden other wildflowers started to spring up and they noticed the grasses were still growing just a little bit too vigorously because wildflowers like a really poor soil and if the soil's quite good then the grasses outcompete so they sowed they just scratched around in the grass and sowed yellow rattle and that's a parasitic plant that, that it slows the grass right down so it gives the wild flowers a chance and so maybe one of the things to do is not to actually bother with seed at all but just stop mowing scratch the grass put in a little bit of yellow rattle but if you really want to try there's a gardener that i really would suggest that you you you, you have a look online and see if you can find out about called peter corn now he gardens in Sweden and he's got this this kind of very different approach to gardening which is this ecological gardening and he's saying look you really have to get to know the plant if you're going to have your meadow actually find out where the plant normally grows what it likes it likes to grow by the side of a stream in swampy in swampy sort of boggy ground it ain't gonna like it if your Scarborough garden is very sandy so let's find out what the plants love then let's see what we've got in our garden and and he's got this really weird way of growing plants because what he's doing is he's taking away I've only just learned about this he takes away the topsoil and he brings in sand and his technique is he, he sows seed and he propagates the plants and pots them and grows them in sand and then he's planting them out in that sand and they eventually grow down through it into the very poor um, subsoil that's there and and the idea behind that is that you've got you've got plants you know if they come from south africa or wherever like that that are growing in their natural environment but they're also harder and they don't get pests and diseases and so if you want to have that really natural look but you want just a little bit of extra sparkle have a look at what corn is doing the next question comes from diane in scarborough and she says 
what would you plant now that will come into its best in 100 years time? Do you think that far ahead when designing new areas in your garden? I think, again, looking at it, perhaps from my perspective, I think working largely in historic sort of places, um, you're definitely thinking that far ahead. And I, I guess you're almost always thinking of trees from that, that perspective. It's, it's the one plant that sort of carries through from centuries past and uh, you know you, you're very conscious of what you're planting and how long it will be there so um, smaller trees generally got a, a, a shorter shelf life and the, and the longer growing ones um, will, will be there for centuries potentially so things like you for instance um, most old garden places and even sort of natural landscapes will have you will feature yews and, and they they've just been around for centuries some of them um even longer so certainly i mean in, I'd, I'd be thinking about a yew tree um depending on what you wanted to do with it i mean wonderful naturally grown and also clipped um so there's lots of uses for them but yeah i'd go down the, the yew tree line i think the next question comes from charlotte in bath and charlotte says i have just moved into a georgian house i'd like to create a garden that is holistic to the setting and have a blank canvas at the moment because it's currently lawn Please, can you talk me through what a Georgian garden might look like? Okay, I did some research into Georgian gardens 34 years ago, <laughs> because basically I used to live inside London and there was, this, there was this street that had these Georgian houses in it and they had long thin gardens at the back and basically uh, we were looking at the idea of, of how to create something that was Georgian. Um, and, and you will discover that, that, that Georgian gardens were not, strictly speaking, gardens. The sort of thing you would find at the, uh, 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 at the back of a house. In fact, gardens didn't really exist as gardens for really quite a long time. And the one thing that changed that space at the back of houses from a yard into a garden was the invention of indoor plumbing. Um, so, 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 so because, because what happened in your back garden was there was a sort of place where you could do the washing, there was basically a lavatory because that's where it was. Uh, there was a pile of coal because that's what you sort of needed in order to keep yourself warm and all that sort of stuff or wood or something. Uh, there could have been, I don't know, a chicken, chicken run or all of that kind of stuff. So it wasn't strictly speaking a garden in the way that we as somebody living in a nice Georgian house in Bath would think of it. So, so it would have had, you know, it would have had a lot of sort of gubbins and sheds and, and all that sort of stuff that, that you actually needed. So, so if you were looking at a purely decorative Georgian garden, the one that I, I remember designing for this that was basically, was basically what she's got, which was a sort of lawn in the middle and then two paths that went up the outside with some planting on the wall. So it was very sort of basic and very sort of simple and, uh, and, and very straightforward. So, so, so... I think that what she has to think, bear in mind is the fact that she is not a Georgian, um, basically, and, and, and things are different. And she does have the advantages of not having to go to the end of the garden every time she wants to pee, um, or, or have to go out and actually wind a mangle in order to be able to wring out the clothes and she has a tumble dryer and a washing machine and all those sort of things. So, 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 so unless she wishes to get rid of all of that, which I'm not sure that many people are going to be prepared to sacrifice that in order to have a Georgian garden, then, then actually the most important thing in any garden is not to try and make it holistic to the setting, but actually to make it holistic to the way that she lives. Okay, there are, there, there, are, there are three things that you take into consideration when you're designing a garden. And number one is indeed, is the style of the house. So, so if you have a, a lovely Georgian house, then what you probably don't do, or a thatched cottage or something, you probably, probably don't do is, is, to, is to make a garden out of stainless steel and mirrors, um, because it would just look kind of silly. Likewise, if you have something that is, that is modernistic and, and uh, made of, of cedar and glass, then don't try and twine honeysuckle and roses around the door because that also will look silly. So, so, so that's the first thing to consider. Uh, the second thing to, is, to consider is actually what you can see from the garden. So you're the garden, what, what, what are the outside views that you've got? You know, you sitting there with your background of the sea, that's actually, the, actually apart from the fact that there's something particularly gorgeous in front of it, which is you. Um, the rest of it, it's, it's about what is behind you. It's about what you can see. So it could be a distant church spire, or it could be a tree in the next door neighbor's garden, anything like that. So that's that. But the third thing, and the most important thing is, who is going to use this garden? Who is going to live in it? Because what you do not wish to do is to create this perfect Georgian garden if you happen to be in possession of three small children and a retriever. 
because they're going to trash it quite quickly. So, so actually what is more important is rather than uh, recreating a garden that works with the house is to make a garden that works with the way that you live. So, so you know, you have, you have children who might need a trampoline. Fine, the Georgians didn't have trampolines, but you can. And that is going to keep your children much more occupied than what the Georgians had, which was probably a hoop and stick. Um, because because no, no, no child nowadays is going to be fobbed off with a hoop and stick when there's an iPad available. Um, so so, so, so the, the, the holisticness of the whole thing is actually about making a garden that works for the way that you are going to use the garden. Uh, and obviously making it so that, I mean, a Georgian house is going to look lovely with pretty much anything planted up around and against it. Uh, so obviously plant plants, but think about the way that you want to use the garden. And that's where the holistic sense of it comes rather than harking back to a, a bygone age. The next question comes from Arnold in Scarborough. And he says, who's your favourite gardener of all time? Oh, Arnold, that's a, I've really thought about this and you know, you, you think about all the gardeners that you've met, and then I thought, no, maybe my favourite one is the one that has had most of an impact. And, and through my horticultural career, I started um, by working in the nurseries as a, as a Saturday person, summer holiday job person at Hilliers um, in the propagation department, went to college, discovered this organization called the Royal Horticultural Society, took their Master of Horticulture. Um, they've been a constant in my, in my entire career and I'm really honored to work with them now. And so I can't have anyone else as my favorite gardener, but this guy called John Wedgwood. And John Wedgwood, who kind of related to the pottery, um, he was a botanist, he was a horticulturist, and in an upper room of a bookshop with a few other people, Forsyth and one or two of the other great notaries of their day, they started in 1800, the Royal Horticultural Society. I don't think they got the first member for four years or so. I think it was the first meeting he chaired was about 1804. But what a guy, you know, so he's a, he's a botanist, he's a horticulturist, and they have this idea of setting up this society and I can't think of anyone that's changed horticultural history more than he did. What do you reckon he was drinking? Do you think he was a pint man or a bit of a bit of a wine swirler? I think creme de menthe, but by the pint. <laughs> Classy. The next question comes from Chris in London and he says, do you think you can mix up heritage garden design and modern garden design successfully? Yeah. Definitely, yeah. absolutely, definitely. You know, every 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 garden uh, that is that is made uh, steals ideas from other places. Uh, garden design is built on larceny, basically, in that we're taking an idea. What you know, what gardeners do is, is 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 that when they're not gardening, they're looking at other things, and and you know, you go and see gardens, I go and see gardens, you think, oh, that's a nice idea. You adapt it, you change it, you twiddle it around. So you take something from a Victorian garden and maybe twisted about in a slightly different way or use a different material and so that is mixing an old idea and a new technique together and that makes something that is that is better and stronger uh, you know the uh, first greenhouses that were built by joseph paxton at chatsworth in 18 something the children of those greenhouses that little aluminium greenhouse that you have in on on your allotment or, or anywhere else so so that is a that is a, a, a an example of mixing things up so it's a simplification and it's a popularization of it. So rather than being something grand that was only there for Duke, it's something that can be there for, for everybody. So, so, so I think it's, it is very, very important. There's no such thing as pure modern garden design because modern garden design has evolved rather than suddenly landed on us as if it was an alien from outer space. It's not something that's gone, boom, bang, it's appeared. 1800, modern garden design was modern garden design. It was, you know, it was, it was the Edwardian times. In... Um, 1700, the big uh, Humphrey Repton and Kate Boozy Brown, that was modern garden design. In 1500, the idea of the Hortus Conclusus and the, Mon and the monastic gardens, that was modern design. In, in 2000 BC in China, that was modern garden design. Does that make, yeah, that, 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 yeah. So, 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 so basically there is no such thing as modern garden design. Modern garden design is an evolution of garden design over the last 2,500 years.
So to, the answer to the question is yes, of course you can, and you should do, and you will do, even if you think you're not. Please tell us why you love gardens. I like gardens because plants grow in them, and I prefer plants to people, and I get on with plants, and it's everything to me is about the plant and if you came and you had a look at my garden um then you would see it's not the most beautiful garden it doesn't have these amazing plant associations color combinations it's just rammed with plants that i've met and i, I just have to have and that's it so it's just it's it, it's like a party where you've not thought about who you've invited and whether they get on together it's just crammed with people why do i love gardens um, well, why would one not love gardens? I mean, basically, everybody loves gardens because gardens are, are the air that we breathe. They are the, the life that we live uh, and they are the joy that we have. There you go. That's why I love gardens. <laughs>